For nearly 50 years, the VFW Armed Forces Award has been presented annually to military members in order to recognize extraordinary achievement to the Armed Forces of the United States. Today, I take great pleasure in introducing our next guest, General James T. Conway. General Conway is a retired United States Marine Corps General who was the 34th Commandant of the Marine Corps for four years. Upon receiving his college degree from Southeast Missouri State University, he was commissioned as an infantry officer in 1970, beginning a career with the military spanning four decades. General Conway's very first assignment was command of a rifle platoon with the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines at Camp Pendleton, where he also served as the battalion's 106 recoilless rifle platoon commander. Later, he served as a Marine Executive Officer aboard the aircraft carrier USS Kitty Hawk and as Commanding Officer of the Sea School at Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego. Shortly after, he commanded two companies in the 2nd Marine Regiment's Operations and Security Section. He also taught tactics at the basic school. He continued to serve on, on, as an Operations Officer for the 31st Marines Amphibious Unit in Lebanon. Once he returned to the United States, he was assigned as senior aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for two years. He graduated from Marine Corps Command and Staff College with honors and took command of the 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, through its eight-month deployment to Southwest Asia during the Gulf War. After the war, he was promoted to colonel and assigned command of the basic school, and in 1995, General Conway was promoted to Brigadier General and again assigned to the Joint Chiefs of Staff where he was promoted to Major General with the following command of the 1st Marine Division. He was then promoted to Lieutenant General and assumed command of the Marine Expeditionary Force in 2002 where he led 60,000 troops through two combat tours in Iraq. In 2006, General Conway was nominated by the President Bush and confirmed by the Senate to be the 34th Commandant of the Marine Corps. With over 25 awards and decorations, General Conway has much to be proud of, particularly his combat service. His rapid movement through the ranks at year after year and graduating with honors many times over truly reinforces the verify that he is a Marine's Marine. General Conway epitomizes the U.S. Marine Corps creed of Semper Fidelis through as always faithful and loyal to service, especially a sense of duty to our nation and to the Marines he served with and also beloved. Comrades, sisters, today we recognize an intra-Marine who fulfills the honorable tradition of extraordinary achievement presented by this award. It is my great privilege to welcome the recipient of the 2011 VFW Armed Forces Award to General John or excuse me, General James Conway. Armed Forces Award Gold Medal and Citation awarded to General James Conway in special recognition and appreciation of his military career spanning four decades, beginning in 1970 as an infantry officer for the United States Marine Corps and culminating upon his retirement after serving four years as the 34th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Throughout his career, he involved all that emphasizes a brilliant military leader, admirably serving his nation through many challenging assignments and position. He has dedicated his career to enhancing the performance and welfare of United States service members, especially to his beloved Marines and their families. Always upholding the core values of the United States Marine Corps, General Conway has earned the greatest respect and admiration of the veterans of foreign wars of the United States. In witness whereof, we have hereunto set our hands in the official seal of the veterans of foreign wars of the United States this 30th day of August, 2011, approved by the National Council of Administration, signed by Richard L. Eubank, Commander-in-Chief, and Alan Gunnar Kent, Adjutant General. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, ladies, uh, for this, this incredible honor. I, uh, and it's especially meaningful uh, to me that it, that it comes from you. Uh, but I accept that you're presenting it to me 
in recognition of those uh, hundreds of thousands of great Marines and the sailors uh, that support us that are out there day in and day out uh, doing such tremendous work. And in that context, uh, again, I'm a, I'm a very honored recipient. I wasn't going to do so, uh, but before we stepped up, Joe Davis asked me to give you just a couple of words uh, on my background. Uh, when I became the Commandant, uh, I did not come uh, from some of the same uh, background and, and, and relationships as some of our previous Commandants. I had no former uh, relations who had been colonels or generals in the Corps. I had not graduated, as was indicated, uh, from the Naval Academy. Uh, in fact, I came from, uh, from Northeast Arkansas uh, and the great state of Missouri. And uh, those of you that are from those states will understand. I'll tell the rest of you uh, when the movie Deliverance came out, a lot of folks where I'm from thought it was a great little love story. <laughs> I remember after about 10 years, Annette and, and our boys and our young daughter at that point went back to visit our folks in Arkansas. I had just made major, and I was very proud of, of uh, what we were doing at that point. My granny met us on the porch, gave me a big hug and said, well, are you a sergeant yet? And I said, no, granny, I don't, I don't think I'll ever make sergeant. And she said, well, that's, that's I hate that. She said, I, I guess if you'd made sergeant, you'd amount to something. At that point, my Uncle Bob chimed in. This is my same Uncle Bob who spent three days in the United States Army. He went off to boot camp and he said on the first day, they gave him a toothbrush and that afternoon they pulled seven of his teeth. He said the next day, they gave him a comb and that afternoon they cut off all his hair. And he said on the third day, they issued him a jock strap. And he went over the hill that night and never did go back. He said, them people is crazy. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so that's, that's some of my background. And uh, I just want you to know, you know who you're giving this wonderful award to. Uh, I assume you got the right guy. Uh, you know, General Eisenhower retired uh, from the services uh, in, back in, in the late 40s. Uh, and about that same time, the Board of Regents at uh, Columbia University were looking for a new president. And they met one morning in a heated discussion, debated back and forth as to who it would be, and came out of the room. And the president of the Board of Regents said to the registrar at Columbia, our man is Eisenhower. Get out the invitation right away. Well, a couple of days later, he was reading the letter he grabbed it off his desk and walked up to his registrar and said, you idiot, you offered it to the wrong Eisenhower. This is going to General David. We wanted it to go to Milton S. Eisenhower, his younger brother, who's a president at Kansas State University. So they gathered the board back and they discussed and they said, well, let's not, let's not embarrass the university here. Let's, you know, he's not qualified to do this job, so we assume he'll turn it down. Well, within a few days, they got a letter back from General Eisenhower, and it said, Gentlemen, uh, regretfully, I, I find myself woefully unprepared to assume this role, uh, but I will accept your gracious offer and do the best job I can. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> uh, yours is an incredible organization. Uh, I've watched it, of course, for, for my entire time uh, both in the service and really before, because there was a Veterans of Foreign War uh, organization in our, our hometown of St. Genevieve, Missouri. And it's just great to watch what you do out there for the community, both in terms of, of the, the activities, the grants, the scholarships, but also in, just in terms of bringing communities together, sort of the social fabric, if you will, of each and every community where you guys and gals are from. It's just, it's just marvelous to watch your work. Uh, you're a model. I mean, I was told on the way in that there are people from other nations who are here looking at how you run a large organization and how you remain an icon uh, in, in American society. You work tremendously. 
uh, with those primary issues at the national level that are important to veterans and people who are in uniform today who will be veterans pretty soon. And there's one other thing that I, I think is especially unique about this organization at this point in time. Uh, about 50% of you folks, my research tells me, uh, are Vietnam veterans. And I think what's unique about that is you contrast the reception you're giving today to our veterans, to the wounded, to all those great young men and women that are serving today. You contrast that to the reception that you received when you came back, and folks, there is no comparison. And I just think there's a certain amount of individual and, and organizational generosity in that that, uh, that really, needs, uh, really needs to be recognized. And, and I want to tell you as I stand here today, thank you for that. Uh, because it means a great deal to the leadership to be able to convey those things to those young men and women that are over there fighting for us, uh, that they're going to be well received when they get home. Yeah, here, here. On the, on, on the topic of Vietnam veterans, let me spend just a moment to tell you about my proudest day in uniform. And I will tell you, it wasn't in the time that I was commandant, it wasn't on the battlefield. It was, in fact, after we got home from Iraq, having taken Baghdad, and sort of between deployments as we got ready to go back over. I was the, the Marine Expeditionary Force Commander. And I had a call one morning from the mayor of Oceanside, which is the little town outside our base out there on the West Coast at Camp Pendleton. And he said, General, I want, we want to hold a parade for you all, uh, and we'd like to have 20,000 Marines to march down our streets on a Saturday morning. I said, well, Mr. Mayor, uh, we can do that, but the number is going to be about 22,500, okay, because I want every Marine that went over there to be a part of that parade and, and feel the warmth and the goodness coming from their fellow citizens. He said, well, if you can do that, I can, I'll get you 80,000 people on the streets of Oceanside that will be from all over Southern California. And so we locked in the deal. The night before the parade, uh, I was sitting home and, and thinking about what I was going to say. They wanted me after the parade to go down to a large amphitheater on the beach and, and, and offer some comments to the assembled folks, both military and civilian. And I was going to contrast the welcome that we were getting to what our Vietnam veterans had not received. And as I sat there, I thought to myself, why just talk about it? Why don't you do something about it? And so I called my chief of staff and I said, listen, I want you to have our guys uh, in graphics make me a very professional looking sign, five feet by 40 feet, that says Vietnam veterans. And the next morning when we arrived, I put a squad on either side of the street and they worked about 20 blocks and they policed up every Vietnam veteran they could find. And there were about 200 of them. And they were in suits, and they were in wheelchairs, and they were in, you know, mainly shirts and ball caps identifying their unit. But there were about 200 of them. And that parade kicked off. I led it. My staff was right behind me. The band was right behind them. And then there was this huge banner that said, Vietnam Veterans. And there were 200 proud guys marching. And ladies and gentlemen, the crowd got it. They understood what we were attempting to do. And I could hear it, but I was told by those who watched the whole parade that the applause for that unit was as great as it was for any unit that had marched with us into Baghdad. And it was a good day for everybody. Those 200 at least finally got their parade. And that was my proudest day in uniform. Thank you. Now, I also believe that those Marines that were in that formation that day and every, every one Marine, soldier, sailor, airman, and Coast Guardsman who have joined since are, are truly a, a special generation. They, they really are. And I'll tell you this, we didn't always think that. Some years ago when, you know, some of us old gray-haired guys sat around and talked about it, we were a little bit concerned about this new generation. Are they going to make good soldiers and Marines? Will they have what it takes if we go into a fight? 
You know, too much time with a joystick in their hand, too much time indoors, not outdoors, maybe not enough discipline. Were they tough enough? We didn't know. Well, I'll tell you, we were wrong. They are incredible. They are eye-watering. I've seen them in combat now on a couple of separate occasions. And their raw courage, their sense of team play, their self-sacrifice, again, just brings tears to your eyes. This is a great young group of Americans, and we are, we are honored. Uh, we are privileged to have them where they are today. And this, is, this country is going to be great for a long time to come as these people grow up and, and, and take on increasing levels of responsibility. Now, there are those that would demean them and say, well, they're in the military because they can't find a job. It's the economy that drives them in, and that's why they're there. That is pure BS, okay? Those kids are there because the nation's at war, and they know we need them to be there, and that, that's, that's why they raise their right hand and march off. I met, yeah, here, here. Met a young man uh, as we had Chow in, in sort of a bunker location in Ramadi. This was in 2006. The heavy fighting was mostly over, but there was still some things going on there. And as, as I went around the room and talked to these 18 or 20 young Marines, I, uh, one young Lance Corporal said it better than everybody else. I said, why would you join the Corps there, Tiger? He said, sir, I'll tell you what, uh, I was 11 years old when they hit the towers. And I was scared. I had no idea that our country could sustain blows like that inside our borders. He said, by the time I got to be 13, I was pissed off. Now I'm 18, and I'm doing something about it. And that's why they're there. That's, that's typical of these great young kids out there. And, and, and that's that young generation, again, that you all uh, support so very, very well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand down, but I want to issue a challenge to you folks before I do. Um, you people represent the knowledge of the military in your various communities uh, like no other. Too few people today serve, and so although, again, our country writ large I think is very appreciative, so very few really understand what it is and in some cases why we're doing what we're doing today. My belief, and I hope you share it by and large, is that Afghanistan is important to us. You know, we didn't start this fight, and the Al-Qaeda weren't necessarily in Iraq when we invaded, but it didn't take them long. And they were there within weeks after we arrived. My division commander, a guy named Jim Mattis, called me on the way to Baghdad. He was about 60 miles outside the city. He said, General, we're in a tough fight this morning, and these are not Iraqis. We don't know who they are, but they're fanatics. And he called me back about two hours later and said, we killed about 300 of them, but the last 12 died charging a tank. And as he went through the pocket litter, they were Syrians, and they were Egyptians, and they were Yemenis. They were from all over the Middle East. They were fanatics, and they were the beginning of the Al-Qaeda organization that we eventually defeated in Iraq. So the momentum is in the right direction. And now we're facing a similar situation in Afghanistan. My view is we need to leave Afghanistan when we can call it a win, or we can feel good about the fact that so much has been accomplished there. We need to keep the momentum going. Were we to pull off and somehow them sort of destroy the concept and, and, and convince people that they chased us out of Afghanistan, would mean that the Al-Qaeda and the extremists would be able to say, in one generation, we beat the Russians and we beat the Americans, writ NATO. That is momentum in the other direction. We don't need that. You know, this war will not be over when we leave Afghanistan. You don't need to look on Iraq and Afghanistan as wars. Those, ladies and gentlemen, are battles in what is probably going to be a 60 or 80 year war against extremism. And we can't necessarily win it. It's going to take the moderates in the religion regaining control of these people. And I'm encouraged by what we see with the Arab Spring too early to say, but this certainly offers another option to some people out there that are generally unhappy in life. But the fact is, we have to maintain the momentum to make sure that we don't give them an easy win simply because we're gauging what we do based on a timeline or an election. Secondly, 
Uh, our nation is in fiscal crisis. Okay, there are going to have to be some tough decisions that are made out there, hopefully by some very intelligent people in relatively short order. And the Defense Department, I think, has probably close to 50 percent of the discretionary money on an annual basis that you find in government. The Defense Department is going to have to be a part of the solution, but it cannot bear the brunt of the solution. It can't be that place where we go to strip back and save and, and avoid some of the other hard decisions that have to be made. There is no peace dividend out there. There is no opportunity to downscale like in the wake of World War II or, or even Vietnam. It's a dangerous world right now. The Iranians are going to have nuclear weapons within probably 24 months. The Chinese would welcome the opportunity in the Pacific to attempt to intimidate us and our allies if our strength grows weak and they're allowed to do so. If you parallel the surge on the national and, and international level uh, of the United States, it matches to some greater or lesser degree our military power. And so I don't believe that we can afford to gut defense. I think that, again, has to be part of the solution. But it can't be that we simply ignore our responsibilities on the global scale, cut back defense to the point where we would then have hollow services. I think we would all pay a very unfortunate price were that to occur. That's my challenge to you. I hope you agree with those thoughts, and I hope that you are not the least bit hesitant to educate your fellow citizens uh, as to the importance of a, of a strong national defense. Again, uh, my wife and I are honored to be with you this morning. Thank you so very much for this tremendous award. God bless you all, and Semper Fidelis.